There's something particularly chilling about unexpected and unexplained TV broadcasts, especially those from the pre-internet era. A time before 24-7 broadcasting, and a period many of us associate with our childhoods, with Saturday morning cartoons and carefree weekends in front of the tube. For a Celine Delgado or a Max Hedrum to suddenly intrude that space and appear in our very living rooms, that would feel like a personal attack on the most fragile part of our psyche. The fact that both Celine and Max are being discussed today, decades after they aired, just goes to show how much a mysterious broadcast can stay lodged in our minds, even if we weren't there to witness them ourselves. Just like the Celine Delgado mystery, today's first entry revolves around a missing persons alert. And just like the Max Hedrum interruption, it comes from the unofficial home of creepy and enigmatic broadcasting. Chicago. January 14th, 1989, was business as usual at Chicago's WMAQ, a local TV station owned by NBC. In the early hours, the channel ended their scheduled programming the same way they always did, by airing a selection of public service announcements, a sermon, and finally, the national anthem, played over the same old pre-recorded footage as always. As the camera zoomed in on the American flag, the few viewers still tuned in no doubt expected the station to cut to their usual sign-off screen. But that didn't happen. Instead, this did. With no pre-warning and no context, the station hard cut to a missing persons alert for a Joanna Lopez. This slide remained on screen for several hours until the morning. Most of the station's viewers were caught off guard for obvious reasons. The photo of the missing girl was extremely grainy, as if it were a photocopy of an actual poster. It's hard to make out any facial details at all and those large glasses give her a deeply uncanny, almost alien-like appearance. There was no voiceover to explain who this Joanna Lopez was, where she had last been seen, or what may have happened to her. In fact, there was no sound whatsoever. For the people who happened to be tuned in, the only thing they would have heard was either ominous silence or the static buzz of their television sets. And just as there was a lack of sound, there was also a disturbing lack of information. Just a very low quality photo of the girl who had disappeared, her name, and an unlabeled phone number to contact who exactly? Her parents? The local sheriff's department? To give you an idea of what a typical missing persons alert looked like, here's one from another NBC affiliated channel around the same time period. Missing Kevin Ayotte. Now age six, last seen Sugarbush, Minnesota, September 30th, 1982. Call 800-843-5678. As you can see, there's plenty of information, along with a voiceover, a clear photo, and the name of the department you should contact. All things absent from the Joanna Lopez alert. It's easy to understand why so many people did, and to this day still do, find this image so disturbing. I mean, picture it. It's late at night and you can't sleep, so you start watching WMAQ. The broadcasting's coming to an end, and you're probably expecting to see another commercial or the sign-off screen. And then, this pops up out of the blue, with no sound and no explanation. But even more unnerving than the broadcast itself were the details of Joanna Lopez's actual case. By which I mean, there didn't seem to be any. For the past 33 years, people have dug through police files, newspaper records, and reports from other TV stations, and no one's found any mention of a Joanna Lopez disappearing in the Chicago area in the late 80s. To this day, there's still no information about her online, and as far as we can tell, this is the only known report of her vanishing that exists. Though it's not the only time her face appeared on television. Whether intentionally or or accidentally, Joanna Lopez made yet another appearance on WMAQ in 1991. 
That night, just after the national anthem came to an end and the station was about to sign off, the exact same missing person slide filled the screen. The only difference being that the image quality was slightly higher this time. But unlike the first broadcast in 89, the slide didn't remain on screen throughout the night. In fact, it only aired for 10 seconds before quickly cutting to the network's usual sign-off screen. Had this second broadcast been a mistake? One that was quickly caught by a technician? If so, how did the slide end up on that night's programming, two years after making its first and only other appearance? If it wasn't a mistake, why would they only screen the image for such a short time, and still give out no further context or details about who Joanna Lopez was? Aside from a few people who had recorded one or both of the broadcasts, Joanna Lopez quickly faded from people's minds. That is, until the 1989 sign-off was uploaded to YouTube by the Museum of Classic Chicago Television. After that, small internet communities picked up on the mystery, which in turn caught the eyes of some popular YouTubers. Now, with the case fully revived, New generations of internet investigators have come up with a number of chilling theories about who Joanna was, and about the nature of the broadcasts themselves. Here are the main ones. Theory 1. Joanna Lopez was a young girl who had been taken, and perhaps murdered. Potentially, she was this still unidentified Jane Doe, found murdered in a Chicago alleyway in 1994. The Doe does somewhat resemble the photo of Joanna, and appears to be of a similar age, though obviously it's hard to tell. Theory 2 This poster was made by the person who had taken Joanna, her trafficker. They had anonymously contacted the TV station and paid for this screen to be displayed at night, only providing a photo of Joanna and her name. There's no other information because they weren't appealing for any. They just wanted her family to contact them so they could begin negotiations. They didn't know who Joanna's parents were, but this was their way of telling them, we have your daughter, call this number if you ever want to see her alive again. Theory 3 Joanna Lopez was a so-called frequent flyer, a youth who made a habit of running away from home. That would explain the half-hearted nature of the appeal in 1989. She then ran off again in 1991, and the network aired the same poster without any updates. In both cases, she returned home soon after the broadcasts, hence why there aren't any police records about her disappearance. Theory 4 Joanna Lopez never existed in the first place, and WMAQ was either playing a trick or conducting a test. For a photo from the late 80s, the image quality was like something from the 60s. The name Joanna Lopez was also extremely generic, like the Spanish version of Jane Doe. The general lack of information given about her also made this seem like a fake appeal, and since there's no records of any Joanna Lopez going missing in Chicago, maybe this really was just a sick joke. With all these new theories now floating around on the internet, the r slash Joanna Lopez subreddit was set up to help investigate the mystery. In the five months since the group was established, its members have made some huge discoveries. Here's what we now know, thanks to them. Firstly, they figured out who the phone number was for. It had been used by various police departments throughout the 80s and 90s, but at the time of the broadcast, the number belonged to Joe Mayo, commander of the youth division of the Chicago Police Department. That seemed to confirm that the broadcast was legitimate, that Joanna Lopez was a real missing person, and importantly, that she was under the age of 18 when she went missing. One of the Reddit users aiding the hunt was Chris Polygon. Chris submitted a Freedom of Information Act request for the name Joanna Lopez to get his hands on any information that may exist about her in the police's database. The authorities got back to him and confirmed that nobody with that name had gone missing in Chicago between 1988 and 1990. That was bizarre, but it certainly doesn't mean that Joanna Lopez wasn't real. As one of the sub's moderators wrote regarding the FOIA request, quote, Illinois is a body present state. This means that you cannot be declared dead unless your body has been found. The law states that they won't release any records that contain information on a currently living person. There are three possibilities in this situation. 
One, we're requesting the wrong years, or the name's been misspelt. Two, the police can't release records because someone involved is still alive, or the body hasn't been located. Three, Joanna was never reported missing to begin with. As this mod went on to state, it's also possible that all the records for Joanna Lopez's case were either lost or kept in paper format and not digitised. But here's where things get really interesting. The group were able to confirm with WMAQ themselves that this was a real broadcast, and that an anonymous source had requested for the slate to be aired instead of the usual sign-off screen. This source was an individual, and not an institution like a foster home as some have suggested. WMAQ also confirmed that the photo used for the appeal was indeed a photocopy. That explained why the image quality was so poor. That graininess, combined with Joanna's large glasses and heavy makeup, are what give the image its creepy aesthetic. Some members of the group were able to clean up the photo and improve the overall quality of it. And using advanced digital editing, user the Lava Hot Shit was able to create this detailed enhancement of Joanna's face, giving us a much more accurate glimpse of what she probably looked like. Two weeks after that recreation by Lava Hot was posted, another user, Binding Bloodline, made a notable discovery in a West Chicago Community High yearbook. A former student there, named Rachel Lopez, bore a striking resemblance to the photo from the sign-off. On top of that, the timelines added up. This Rachel Lopez would have been a freshman in 1988, and the first Joanna Lopez broadcast was in 1989. Members of the group started theorising that Rachel was Joanna's real name, or that perhaps, shortly after her vanishing, she decided to go by Joanna for whatever reason. Well, the resemblance was certainly there, but unfortunately, the high school's website also had other yearbooks from the years 89 to 91, which also featured this Rachel Lopez. She'd been present for all four years of high school. That means, unless she'd gone missing on two separate occasions and had been quickly found both times, then in all likelihood, this wasn't her. With that realisation, people were starting to lose hope that the Joanna Lopez mystery would ever be solved. But then, just last month, another, much more promising discovery was announced by one of the group moderators. User Bubblegum Trad just contacted me on Discord. They just got off the phone with a Joanna Lopez from Chicago, who ran away from home in 1989. They said it could be her, and they'll get back in touch soon. Is it an unfortunate coincidence, or is this our goal? Only time will tell. But two Joanna Lopez's going missing in 1989 in the same city would be ridiculous. We won't be disclosing how we got the number out of the safety and protection of the people involved, but I have verified the information with Bubblegum. They're being honest. Now we just need to see if Joanna will come through and call us back. If she does, we may be at the end of the investigation. If it isn't her, we've got the world's worst coincidence on our hands. Stay tuned. Bubblegum Trad would go on to explain how when he called this Joanna Lopez, she'd reacted very authentically. However, she did tell them that she had only run off for a few days back in 89, and that her parents probably wouldn't have contacted any news stations about it. Still, this was a genuinely exciting moment for those following the mystery. Could this be it? Could the Joanna Lopez from the broadcasts have been found? Unfortunately, we still don't know. Despite emailing her a photo of the missing poster, this Joanna Lopez still hasn't replied to Bubblegum to confirm that it was her. So, either this really was the Joanna from the broadcast, and she simply didn't want to discuss some bad memories from the past. Or, this really was just a huge coincidence, and this unconnected woman was just freaked out by the whole situation. But what do you think? Could this really be the Joanna Lopez we've been searching for? If not, then is the real Joanna still out there somewhere, alive and well? This is now a confirmed missing persons broadcast, so why are there no police records of Joanna's case? We don't have all the answers yet, but with each passing month, the Joanna Lopez subreddit seems to be getting closer and closer to resolving this mystery. I highly recommend you head over there and help join the hunt, or at least keep an eye on how things develop. This concludes another day of outstanding
Outstanding television programming on WMAQ-TV, Channel 5, NBC in Chicago. WMAQ-TV constantly strives to maintain high programming standards in the public interest. I'll keep this next entry short, because there's really not much information about it online. But what there is, is absolutely horrifying. Ray J. Sharif Black was a nurse practitioner anaesthetist from Baltimore, whose life was seemingly crumbling around him. For three years, he had been having trouble with his ex-wife, Wendy Black, who, according to Jay, didn't let him see his kids. Wendy had filed multiple protection orders against Jay, saying that she didn't feel safe around him and feared for her life. All of her requests were denied by the court. Jay eventually moved on from Wendy and ended up having some children with his new girlfriend, Tara LeBang. But by the end of 2021, things had turned sour between them and Jay and Tara separated. Jay began to worry that his life was about to repeat itself. And on December 11th, 2021, he snapped. That afternoon, he began a Facebook livestream from outside a house, talking to his viewers about the issues he was having with his ex-wife Wendy, the drawn-out custody battle he'd been dealing with, and the allegedly false accusations that he was having to defend himself from. He then began saying how he had just gotten into an argument with his other ex, Tara. For the first 50 seconds of the video, it appeared as if this stream was just a way for Jay to let off some steam, to get some things off his chest to confide in any of his Facebook friends who would listen. But it soon became apparent that that wasn't his intention at all. This video wasn't an appeal for sympathy. It was a confession. After bringing up his trouble with Tara, Jay dropped a bombshell that none of his friends saw coming. One that completely changed the tone of the video. You know, we got in a fight, first thing she does is threatening that she's going to do the same thing. You're never going to see your kids, blah, blah, blah. It's the holidays, man. I don't have no family, nothing. Anyway, I just did something crazy, man. I just shot my ex-girlfriend in the head, yo. Um, felt like a dream. Like, I never thought I would be that guy. Um, Jay wasn't lying. When the authorities caught wind of the live stream, they immediately went to Tara's home in South Baltimore. Inside, they found her lifeless body, sprawled out on the floor. Jay had put a hole through her head. But unfortunately, that wasn't where the video ended. In the final moments of the stream, Jay says that this all really started with his ex-wife, Wendy. And so, quote, She next. Then I'm gonna do myself, too. And that's when we find out where he'd been streaming this whole time from just outside Wendy's house. I can't go to prison, so the person that really started my depression and all of this is my ex-wife. So she next, and then I'm going to do myself too, but I just wanted to say this to people. Don't play with people's emotions, man. Don't lie on these men. Oh, here's my ex-wife right here. Today's the day. Today's the day. Again, Jay wasn't joking. In the final moments of the video, we can see Wendy, who was pregnant at the time, peeking out of her front door as Jay quickly approaches her. The video cuts as he forces his way into her home. Seconds after ending the stream, Jay shot Wendy, and then calmly picked up his two daughters put them inside the car parked in the driveway, and walked back inside the house. Finally, he ended his own life with a blast to the head. Needless to say, this is a very harrowing video. The calmness in Jay's voice as he explains what he's done and what he's about to do, somehow that relaxed demeanour makes the clip all the more chilling. Jay mentioned in the stream how he didn't want to spend the holidays alone. But after his selfish actions... That's exactly the position he left his kids in, after slaying their mothers and himself. Utaho no Tatari 
or in English, Utaho's Curse, is a relatively obscure Japanese indie horror series made using the Wolf RPG editor. In part one, you play as Utano Yamano, a girl whose happy home life is shattered when she returns home one day to find her parents dead, her sister possessed by a red mask, and her grandmother as this thing. At least someone's having a good time. After that pleasant start to the game, you'll spend the rest of your time exploring very large and very demon infested houses, hotels and shrines, following a trail of notes left behind by Utano's sister, uncovering clues and encountering bizarre entities, all while being pursued by this terrifying meat mannequin. Part 2 sees you playing as Shizune, a reporter investigating the mysterious disappearance of Utano from Part 1. The games certainly have an eerie atmosphere about them, what with all the jarring sound effects and disturbing visuals. There's just something about these warped, realistic images contrasting with the 2D sprites which gives the games a really haunting quality. Now in Japan, Utaho no Tatari has a cult fanbase, but since these games were never translated into English, they didn't receive as much international attention as other similar titles like Yume Nikki. That is, until several years ago, when a mysterious and unsettling glitch was brought up in the r slash creepy gaming subreddit, one that most players hadn't experienced. As reported by a small minority of players, when they reached this shrine area in part 2 and walked around for a while, their games randomly crashed. A jumbled string of error messages appeared and locked them out of the game. After this error message, their screens flashed four times before this image of a seemingly dead woman popped up out of nowhere, accompanied by an equally horrible noise. Those who stumbled into this glitch were of course creeped out by it, but most assumed that they had just bumped into an enemy without realising and patiently waited for the game over screen to appear. But it never did. Their games had frozen. The only way for them to get off this screen was to close the game and restart it. So, in their minds, this almost certainly wasn't a scripted event. Most people who tried to deliberately trigger this crash also failed, suggesting this really was just a random glitch that didn't occur in most playthroughs. According to other people who have explored this mystery, this picture doesn't appear anywhere else in the game. When you're playing a horror game, you expect creepy imagery to crop up from time to time, but this photo really struck people for two reasons. Firstly, because this unexplained glitch and creepy picture were hidden within a bug and clearly weren't meant to be discovered. And secondly, because the image itself looked a little too real to some people, as if it were a photo of an actual dead woman. So what caused the glitch? Why did this picture appear after the crash? And just how real was the photo itself? Let's try and answer those three questions. If or when you encounter this glitch, the error message that appears on screen is different depending on your locale. If you're outside of Japan, you'll be met with a string of garbled characters, which may have you thinking that this was a genuine crash. But if you switch your system locale to Japan, then your game will still crash. But instead of a meaningless string of characters, the text will display as intended. Now to most of us, this too just looks like an ordinary crash screen. But if you can read Japanese, 
that's obviously not the case. It's actually a string of typical sounding error messages, but with some horror sentences mixed in. For example, one part reads, Location. Date. Utaho no Tatari 2. The data is being damaged. Possible cause is... So, it seems like this glitch wasn't actually a glitch at all, but was a calculated jump scare. Indeed, this text is actually presented as an encounter between the player's current character, Shizune, and an evil version of the former protagonist, Utano, who seems to have become possessed after disappearing at the end of the first game. Given that part one begins with Utano discovering her mother's headless body, the inclusion of this image also makes a lot of sense. I mean, it does look like a detached head. With that context, it's clear that the error message was intentional, and we're meant to interpret it as either a demonic Utano presenting her mother's head to us, or Utano's own severed head communicating with us directly. If we dig around in the game's data files, we can see that the image is actually titled Yabai. Yabai can mean a lot of things depending on the context, but in this case it would translate to something like, oh my god. So I guess the game's creator thought this image was particularly horrifying too, and figured it would be a scary thing to include in a fake crash. He thought this image was so scary, in fact, that despite what some have suggested, this actually isn't the only time it appears in the game. Here's the same asset appearing as part of a weird live action segment in part 2. As you can see, it only flashes up briefly, but it's there. So, we now know that this so-called glitch was actually an easter egg, designed to mess with a few unsuspecting players. But what the game files don't tell us is where this image originally came from, and whether it's real or fake. It's not unheard of for homebrew developers to throw images of real dead bodies into their games. The infamous Game Over screen from Hong Kong 97 springs to mind. What's more, this was a small, free to download indie game, not some studio project. It's conceivable that the creators could have included a highly saturated photo of an authentic body for either shock value, their own amusement, or because that's the only asset they could get their hands on. So is the picture real? Well, doing a reverse image search turned up nothing, so there was only one way to find out for sure. I put on my detective hat, did some internet sleuthing and found the Twitter page of the game's creator, a guy by the name of Payan. Says here his last tweet was made in 2019, which isn't a good sign, but hold up. Says here that this is his old account. So let's click on this link to find his new one, and well, last tweet was in 2017. Given that he had set his DMs to private, I got the impression that he was a man who was hard to contact. Without holding on to much hope, I decided to leave a comment under Payan's last tweet on both accounts, asking if he remembered the origin of the image. Given his post history, it's likely he doesn't speak English, and honestly, my Japanese is pretty atrocious. But handily, my lovely wife's a native speaker, so I asked her to translate my message to Payan. And no reply. Unfortunately, the guy seems to have disappeared from the internet entirely, taking the answer to this mystery with him. Unless he returns, I'm afraid we can only speculate whether this image is real or fake. I thought it looked like an edited version of Girl with a Pearl Earring, but putting them side by side, you can see that the angle's all wrong. So who is this a picture of? And should we be getting Hong Kong 97 vibes or not? I'm starting to think we'll never know. A huge thank you to all of my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. That one guy Thomas, Jesse Jug, Alex Greensaw, Alicia Jaggles, Anikra, Anya Yekaterina Faustov, Azriel Warakai, Beatrice Matarazzo, Charlie Lackey, Chief Kochuake, Colin Monsma, Connor Lothan, Crawford K. McDonald, Expand Ong, Gina Valera, Grace Archie, 
Infamous Sempapi, Leonardo Martinez, Macala May, Mackenzie Griffin, Myra Lancaster, Monica Mendoza, Nadine, Natalie Escobedo, Peter Logdurag, Philip Wester, Procupidine Natter, Taylor and Monica Gruink, The Only Dorita, Zane, Mrs. Avon Rankin, The Deck of Cards, Hamish K, Nephus 1988, Jamie Dreams X, and Lydia Glassley. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. It really helps the channel out. Remember to smash that like button or I'll smash you, and you'll be hearing from me again very soon. Until then, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.